Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into Square Enix's recently released Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and see how it stacks up visually, narratively, and from a gameplay perspective to the beloved 1997 original game. Now, before we get started, it's important to note that these two titles are separated by nearly 27 years. A lot has changed since the days of the original PlayStation, so we should fully expect this remake to be visually well beyond the capabilities of that classic experience. So while we will be taking another look at how the visuals have been adapted using Square's newer technology, the bulk of this comparison will center more on how things like the story, gameplay, and the open world experience have been tweaked to accommodate all of the pretty bells and whistles. Additionally, I feel it's important to note once again that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is not the full Final Fantasy VII experience. Like the previous remake that released back in 2020, Rebirth is only a fraction of the original experience, stretched out four times over with new content, gameplay mechanics, and other features. For that reason, we're going to focus our attention on only the sections of Final Fantasy VII between the initial Midgar chapters and the end of Part 1. Also, while I will purposely avoid major story spoilers for both the classic and remake, there is still a risk of some minor spoilers throughout this video, so please refer to the timestamps that I've provided to skip over the story section if you want to keep all of those changes a surprise. Alright, so let's kick this comparison off by first going over the presentation. Now for the most part, all the observations here are pretty much identical to those that I already made back in 2020 when comparing the first part of this remake to the original game. And despite being moved over to the newer, much more powerful PlayStation 5 hardware since then, those observations remain consistent when looking at Rebirth. Character models, for example, all share the same updated core design as before, with the old blocky polygonal world exploration version of Cloud and his team being reimagined as more detailed, complex, and, while still slightly stylized, somewhat realistic versions of their former selves. The designs are extremely faithful to the original 97 vision, with all the same classic outfits, hairstyles, and every cumbersome looking weapon being retained exactly. The enemies are similarly brought back into the fold with the remake, and have been faithfully reimagined, no matter how quirky and unusual they may have appeared initially. Having played both games side by side the past couple of weeks, I was surprised to see that not only are most of the random enemies from the original game retained here, but they even behave a lot like those original enemies too, with many of the same attacks, only adapted to function in a more active combat setting. There are a few smaller enemies that may be missing from the roster, though there's so many throughout the 80 to 100 hour experience that it's difficult to say for sure without running through a comprehensive list. Next up, let's talk about the environments. Now, you'll remember with the 2020 remake that the focus for that game was solely on the sprawling cyberpunk metropolis that was Midgar. It was a bold decision by Square to limit themselves to only this area, considering the original game only spends about four to five hours there in its opening chapters. But Square took those few hours and increased it tenfold, with each sector in the city being stretched considerably and dozens of new side quests, activities, and other secrets to discover to help fully realize the potential of the Midgar chapters. With Rebirth, Square Enix has applied that same mentality to the even more ambitious world map environment, and most of the key locations found within that world map. The worlds of Rebirth are massive by comparison, with a huge uptick to the level of verticality and geographic complexity that makes each area more interesting to explore. For players unfamiliar with how the original game worked, once you've completed that opening act in Midgar, the player is then placed into a sort of open world, top down map screen, where they can freely walk Cloud around this very basic looking landscape to reach distinct landmarks that will then teleport the player into more traditional rendered backdrops. The opening town of Calm, for example, is shown in this world map as a small grouping of little buildings. But after walking into it directly, the game transitions to the actual town of Calm that appears much more detailed and houses a few things like vendors, save points, items, and mission objectives for the main storyline. Throughout the player's journey, new modes of transportation are made available in the map screen, allowing traversal into brand new, previously blocked areas, 
A chocobo, for example, is needed to safely cross a swamp to reach this cave. A buggy is needed to traverse the desert or shallow rivers. And the damaged bronco plane that functions more as a boat can be used to traverse the shallow waters around the main continents. For an original PlayStation game, the scope of Final Fantasy VII's world map is incredibly ambitious, selling players on the illusion of a massive continent-spanning adventure. But with the technical advancements afforded to games today, Rebirth takes an even more ambitious approach to its environmental design. Rather than having players walk across a blank representation of these key biomes, Rebirth gives players a series of massive regions to explore firsthand, many of which are connected directly to give the illusion of a seamless open world experience. The grasslands, for example, are a fully realized interpretation of that blank grassy area immediately outside Midgar. This was originally just a big empty green slate, with a few hills and a lone chocobo farm sitting in the middle of nowhere. But in Rebirth, those hills are now populated with new cliff sides, boulders, windmills, buildings, and other structures. Vegetation like trees, bushes, flowers, and other details will flood the immediate area, only limited partially by the game's set LOD. Most importantly, the battles aren't just random encounters players will accidentally run into as they go from point A to point B. Everything in the player's immediate vicinity is being rendered in real time. Meaning, if you're not in the mood to fight, you can simply walk around the enemies roaming across the valley. This also means that the battles themselves don't take place in separate instances of the game. It's all seamless and built directly into the world itself. So, any obstacles in the environment can play a direct role in the combat as well, assuming they're within the radius of the battle, of course. Adding to this is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's largely increased presence of the fan favorite Chocobos. Chocobos are a beloved icon of Final Fantasy, though despite showing up several times in the original game, they actually don't get all that much screen time. You basically just ride a chocobo once to cross a swamp and never need to again until the chocobo races. To address this, Rebirth makes chocobos a major part of the game's traversal systems. Like before, your first chocobo can be found in the grasslands region towards the beginning, with assistance from the caretakers of a nearby chocobo farm. Though instead of battling enemies around a chocobo and feeding it greens to keep it from running away, players instead need to complete these basic stealth mini-games, where they need to creep up on the unsuspecting chocobo and jump on to break them. Doing so unlocks that chocobo for the region, and allows players to call them in whenever they want. Adding to this are unique chocobos per region that have their own methods of traversal. The basic yellow chocobo runs and dashes around as expected, but the dark-feathered chocobos of Junon can be used to climb up marked walls. Green chocobos in the Gungaga jungles can bounce long distances on large mushrooms, and the blue chocobos of Cosmo Canyon can glide through the air, soaring on updrafts from giant fans. The only thing that seems to be sadly missing from Rebirth's chocobo offerings, then, is the secret chocobo dance that, unless there's some secret trigger that I don't know about, appears to have been neglected this time around. But that's minor when compared to some of Rebirth's other environmental shortcomings. For one, despite Rebirth's substantially larger size, these newer, reimagined areas still feel more separate than they ever did before. The grasslands, for example, don't feel as though they're directly on the other side of the mountain from the Junon fields like before. It instead feels as though it's a totally separate game world, connected via a very brief loading screen. This means you can't actually sail around the entire world using the Bronco. You can cross the ocean between Costa del Sol and Junon if you want, but these seem to be separate instances of the game world broken up by loading transitions too. You can't even dock at any beach you want like you could before, or drive the buggy through the jungles of Gengaga. What's more, the newer environments of Rebirth also appear to be missing a few smaller areas featured in the original game. The bigger of these omissions is undoubtedly the small rocket village on the western continent, where players initially meet with Sid and board the Bronco for the first time. This section of the game, along with Sid's backstory, are not at all present in Rebirth. The Wutai village, along with Yuffie's optional side missions that take place there, also seem to be missing. My best guess is that both of these critical character-developing sections of the original game are being saved to pad out the length of the final part of the remake trilogy, 
though this change does have a direct impact on how the story is told, and not necessarily for the better. So overall, while the world has undoubtedly grown in size a significant amount, the compromises made here to allow for such an increase do ultimately limit the feeling of cohesiveness present in the original vision, no matter how small that original game actually was by comparison. Moving on, let's break down some of the biggest changes that have been made to the game's narrative. Now, initially, I had set out to do a step-by-step -step breakdown of every change, but as I played more of the game, I realized it would take hours to cover most of the little changes found throughout. The game follows mostly the same story beats from the start to finish, ending just around the same time as the original's part one ending. But occasionally, certain events are moved around, taking place either the first or second visit to a certain location. Some character intros happen sooner than before, some later, and some characters that barely said more than a sentence in the past now have fully multi-phased boss fights attached to them greatly expanding their role in the overarching adventure. It's a hugely ambitious new take on the classic story, building off of the new Whispers of Fate aspects established prior, along with things established in the spin-off title Crisis Core Reunion and the Yuffie expansion in 2020's remake. For the sake of providing at least some interesting examples of major changes here, one of the most notable changes I noticed is probably around the Upper Junon section where the Avalanche crew need to sneak around dressed as Shinra soldiers to infiltrate a large military parade. In the original game, the upper Junon location is pretty barren, with mostly empty streets and serves as a very brief backdrop to the goofy sequence where you run into the back of a parade line in order to sneak onto a cargo ship. That whole section takes all of like two minutes, but in the remake, the entire upper Junon area is completely fleshed out with hundreds of NPCs on screen at times, along with new shops and interactive opportunities. What's more, the player is now confronted directly by the head of Shinra itself, adding a little more depth and complexity to the relationship between Shinra and Avalanche. And instead of a cargo ship, the players are now rewarded with a ticket aboard a nearby cruise ship, which ties in nicely with the more light-hearted, vacation-heavy vibes of the Costa del Sol destination. Other changes include things like more proper character building for Barret, Aerith, and Red 13, more run-ins with Sephiroth, consistent with his extended appearances in the previous remake, and a massive increase to the number of optional missions throughout that help to expand on Cloud's relationship with his friends, along with secondary characters like Johnny. It's all handled very well, and I felt a far greater sense of connection with most of these characters by the time the credit rolled far more so than I ever had with the original. Though there's certainly some areas that could be fleshed out further in the final entry that will help make the full remake package more compelling. Finally, let's talk about some of the biggest changes to the gameplay design. Now since I've already discussed these changes at length in my previous comparison, I'm going to be a bit more brief in the more general changes as I feel most players at this point are likely well familiar with how the remake handles things like combat and traversal. In the original game, players control Cloud almost exclusively, as they walk across beautifully rendered still image backdrops of various environments, interact with NPCs, grab useful items, and are randomly thrust into battles. When entering a battle, the game switches to a separate, turn-based battle screen, with 3D rendered models of the combatants trading hits using a mixture of physical attacks and magic. In the remake, these two things are no longer separated, Everything is connected seamlessly, with players able to clearly see NPCs, items, and enemies at all times. Instead of the battles being turn-based, Rebirth and its predecessor, Remake, opts for an active combat style, where lengthy wait times to trigger attacks are replaced with more modern hack-and-slash action, with the ability to lock onto targets in a 3D space and strike with flashy combos, dodges, blocks, and parries. The catch is that these basic attacks do very little damage to the more challenging enemies, and are used instead to build an ATB meter shown in the bottom right corner of the screen. Once these segments are filled, players can then trigger more effective abilities, whether they be powerful attacks, magic casts, summons, items, or synergy attacks. Adding to this is the enemy stagger bar. This appears under each enemy's health bar, and is key to defeating more difficult foes. By striking an enemy using attacks that it's weak to, like certain elemental attacks, 
enemies can be pressured, increasing the stagger bar at a faster rate. Once the stagger bar is full, then the enemy will be temporarily disabled, allowing players to land their most powerful attacks like limit breaks. It's a really engaging system, and one that gets even more interesting once you mix in things like buffs, shields, increased attack damage, and other status effects. Another cool feature unique to Rebirth is the introduction of synergy abilities. These are brand new cooperative attacks, triggered by two party members that can further enhance your strategy during combat. These attacks typically come with a passive benefit, like extending an enemy's stagger time while they're incapacitated, or raising the limit meters for team members. The catch is that these can only be used so many times per battle, as the cost for using them increases with each subsequent use, and the attacks can only be used once both involved party members have dealt enough damage to an opponent solo making it a bit more involved than a typical ability command. Also new to Rebirth is the Folio progression system. While all the previous progression systems remain the same, these Folio machines and vendors found throughout the world can be used to spend earned skill points for ranking up on new passive benefits. These include increased damage percentages, critical hit strength, and even unlocking new synergy attacks. Additional weapon enhancements can also be achieved by maxing out weapon proficiency for each weapon, giving incentive to mix up the player's arsenal outside of just the base stats. It's all far more involved than the bare-bones progression systems offered in the past, and by fully embracing all of these systems, players will make some of the more challenging boss battles much more manageable. Then of course, we can't talk about the gameplay in Rebirth without discussing the exhaustive number of new minigames, side missions, and other activities on offer. A big part of the appeal to this section of the original game was the addition of these fun, lighthearted activities. Areas like the Golden Saucer in particular put players through a gauntlet of silly minigames, expanding on Final Fantasy's more lighthearted side while challenging players with things like chocobo races, gladiator arenas, and well, whatever this is. Rebirth preserves all of this content and builds on it in a huge way. The chocobo races in particular feel like a full-fledged kart racing game, complete with several different courses, multiple chocobos with unique stats, and even chocobo customization with purchase gear. That silly Moogle arcade game from the original no longer appears in the Golden Saucer, because it's now a much bigger minigame built into the whole of the open world, with mog stools located in each region that house a silly minigame that tasks players with rounding up Moogles while dodging their attacks. Other new minigames include the returning Fort Condor, a dolphin show, a survival game involving frogs, a Guitar Hero-style piano minigame featuring classic Final Fantasy VII scores, a Rocket League-inspired minigame with Red 13, a workout minigame with Tifa, a carnival-style shooting gallery, and so much more. One of the best new minigame additions is undoubtedly the Gwent-inspired card game Queen's Blood, that Square might have gone a bit overboard with in that it's featured almost everywhere throughout the game, from being baked into main story missions to having two to three different challengers at every major location. On the bright side, it's a pretty enjoyable card game, tasking players with dropping cards on tiles to dominate rows, with the highest point total per row determining who will earn those points towards their overall score. Altogether, it's a lot, way more than the original Final Fantasy VII game offered. And while it may not all be quality content, I did find myself enjoying at least some of these side activities enough to deviate from the storyline for quite some time. Overall, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's gameplay design is hugely more ambitious than its predecessor, and should offer hours of content for players to enjoy, even if they're very familiar with that original classic. Finally, let's wrap up with a brief sound comparison. Which game do you feel has the better sound quality and design? 
your windows you'll see open waters be advised there may be sudden ocean swells how was that uh, just kill me now <laughs> this thing's practically a paddle boat she can swallow us whole on a whim so we're sticking to the shallow And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is a beast of a game. Of all the remakes, remasters, and sequels that I've covered in this series over the years, none have come even close to the ambition of this project. Square Enix has absolutely delivered on their promises, taking one of the largest chunks of the original Final Fantasy VII and expanding it 40 times over, with lots of interesting story additions, gameplay mechanics, and open world activities. So the question now is, was it worth bulking up an already huge game to be this big? Admittedly, there are a lot of weak side missions built into Rebirth that don't necessarily add much to either the story or the gameplay. There's story changes that arguably hurt the pacing, and there's of course all the impossible to ignore technical issues, mainly those lower res textures. But on the flip side, Rebirth is a feast of technical improvements over the original game, building on the artistic direction first established back in the 90s and restoring it with a level of meticulous care we rarely see in other remakes of a similar caliber. When it comes to quality remakes, Final Fantasy VII Remake and now Rebirth are high on my list as some of the very best. And you owe it to yourself, whether you're a longtime fan or a complete newcomer, to give this remake a try. But what do you guys think? Are you enjoying Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, or do you still feel Squaresoft's original version of the game to be a better option? Let me know in the comments section, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this posted every week. <laughs>